In this unit, we will travel much too quickly and much too superficially through two vast geographical areas, Africa and Oceania. The good news is you're going to hear a lot less of the disembodied voice in this unit. Now it's your turn to teach each other. I'm not going to talk a lot about these presentations you have in the assignment sheet, but remember that you're going to be leading the discussion and that you want to focus particularly strongly on the cultural context. Africa is a very big continent with a huge diversity of cultures. I spent the summer between my junior and senior years in high school as an exchange student living with an African family in Uganda, which I've circled here in red. It's a small country with only about 35 million people, and yet Ugandans speak more than 40 different languages. There's also a major religious divide between Muslims in some areas of the north and Christians and animists in the south. In the south, the Bagandan kings can trace their lineage back through 36 kings, starting in the 14th century. Other ethnic groups in the nation formed very different social and often less uh, structures and often less hierarchical social structures. So all of this makes me nervous about making any generalities about African art, but I'm going to anyway because you need to have some general concepts to help you organize your thinking. I borrowed some of this from the College Board curriculum, some of it from my own reading and research. It is not an exhaustive list. Before I start throwing uh, lists at you, however, let's stop for a moment and look at a work that is not one of your required works and note that I'm not yet identifying. You've presumably never seen this work and you don't know anything about the culture, but you've had a lot of opportunity by now to look at art. So what do you notice about this work? What may, have you, what may you have seen before? Well, there's clear hierarchy of scale, which suggests that the fellow in the center is maybe more important than everybody else around him. That means he's probably a king, a nobleman, or a priest, or even a god. The heads are disproportionately large. The hands along the bottom probably signify something. The figures on top might represent ancestors or supernatural beings. The human figures seem to be dressed for war. So what further information does the title give us? Why would people erect an altar to the hand and arm? What do hands and arms do? So I'm going to read what the British Museum website has to say about this work. Like many West African peoples, the Edo of Benin see the various fates of mankind as governed both by destiny and by personal action. Destiny is located in the head and personal action in the hand and arm. Ceremonies devoted to the head tend, therefore, to involve ancestors and destiny, while those strengthening the hand involve an individual and his own achievements, often military achievements. Edo men also celebrate a festival of the head during which the king and priests offer sacrifices to altars such as this. Ikenga, by the way, also means strong right arm, standing for physical prowess. Note that this work was made by still another people from what today is Nigeria. And what would you guess is the symbolism of those enormous horns? Yep, power and masculinity. We have seen this before. The work on the left is one of our required works. What we, why we would know this is probably made for a king, even if I didn't give you the title. It's made from cast brass. Materials are one of the biggest clues in African and Pacific arts to the importance and meaning of an object. Note that the date is three centuries earlier. What does that tell you? It tells you that this is a culture that has survived and thrived over a long period. Here's a little information from, sorry, Wikipedia. The Benin kings and chiefs have worshipped the hand since the time of the 15th century warrior king. The wars of expansion that King Aware waged and won not only gave him the impetus be to become a devotee of the hand, but may also have exposed him to other areas of Nigeria where hand worship was practiced. Note, by the way, how the king is stepping on a defeated enemy. What does that remind you of? How about the Palette of Narmer and the Victory Steel of Naram Sin? So here's another work from the same culture. It's another Ikogobo. What's different about this one? If the title led you to say animals, careful, both works actually depict animals. The British Museum just put animals into this work's title. What's really intriguing about this work, and it may be hard to see, is the row of musketeers above the frieze. Muskets were acquired from the Europeans who are now regularly trading in Africa. 
and musketeers include both African and Portuguese soldiers, an indication of Portugal's support for Benin's king. Here's a 1668 engraving of the Oba's palace complex in Benin City. The Oba is shown in the foreground on horseback, surrounded by dancers, dwarves, and animals. His palace is in the background. Most Edo works from the Kingdom of Benin left Nigeria in the late 19th century when the British sent a punitive expedition against the kingdom. The Oba's forces had massacred a British trade delegation, although apparently without the Oba's knowledge or permission. The British, moreover, were eager to gain more commercial access to the region. Most historians consider the British invasion to have been brutal and unjustified. But there's no question they collected a lot of loot and they hauled it away without the permission of the Oba or his people. The presence of these works in museums all around the world where remains a controversy in the art world. I need to move on, but before I leave the fascinating culture of Benin, for now, I want to make a point that the contextual images in this unit should reinforce. Many of these peoples and cultures continue both to pursue and to update the traditions that surround these works of art. So here, for example, is the current Obas Palace in Lagos, Nigeria. Later in this unit, I'll walk you through an essay that talks about how certain works featured in performances were intended to unlock access to power. Note that many of your works come with contextual images that show how they were used. Here's an example, maybe my favorite example. And here's another example from the Ashanti people of Ghana. The golden stool is thought to contain the soul of a nation. It isn't actually used as a stool. In fact, it's never allowed to touch the ground. And only the king, shown here, can even touch the stool. When a British representative tried to sit on the stool, it sparked a rebellion. Mblo masks appeared in the final sequence of large-scale public festivals known as Mblo. Mblo performances consist of a succession of dances that culminate in tributes to the community's most distinguished members. Individuals honored in this way are depicted by a mask that is conceived of as their artistic double or namesake. The masks themselves, however, are highly stylized. They aren't intended to represent the honoree's appearance. And this leads me to my next theme, which is that African art is often more conceptual or expressive than representational. So, for example, the ndop, or portrait of a Cuba king, followed strict conventions. The head had to be one-third the size of the body, since the head was the seat of intelligence. The individual king was identified not by his facial features, which were stylized, but by the geometric motif on the base and his symbol, or ebol. Most African sculpture is frontal, with enlarged heads, sometimes enlarged sexual organs, reflecting the emphasis on the head as the seat of knowledge and often power, and the importance of fertility. Note the well-endowed Fang reliquary, or Bieri, on the left. We've already talked about how this work conveys power and authority. This photograph shows the 38th Oba of Benin, who ascended the throne in 1979. With this work, the woodcarver makes the initial Nkisi image and brings it to the ritual specialist's home. This ritual specialist, called an Nganga, must then activate the figure to release its power. The Nganga fills special cavities in the sculpture, which are usually in the head and stomach region, with materials such as ash, soil, herbs, and animal parts that are believed to have special medicinal and magical properties. Over time, as clients approach the Nganga seeking solutions to problems, resolutions to disputes, cures for illnesses, various objects are added to the Nkisi's exterior. When a problem is resolved, a disagreement settled, or a cure established, the principal parties drive a blade, nail, screw, or other sharply pointed object into the Nkisi Nkondi. So, for example, if two parties come before the figure to make peace with each other, the conditions agreed upon are symbolically lodged into the Nkondi with a sharp object, which is really similar to the Western tradition of signing a contract. Or if one person accuses another of stealing property, both would go before the Nkisi Nkondi and, while driving in a nail which activates the spirit's power, would ask to be destroyed by the image if caught telling a lie. Only the most important people in society could wear the aka or elephant mask, which was used at the royal court. Indeed, the elaborate beadwork was itself a symbol of power. Again, materials are highly significant in African art. In the figure on the right, we see hierarchical scale used to mark the high status of the senior wife. 
She actually crowned the king and was responsible for protecting him during the reign. The junior wife was much smaller, and my guess is she got bossed around. Generally, men were builders and carvers, and men alone were permitted to wear masks. An exception was the Bundu mask of Sierra Leone's Mende people. They were worn by women in coming-of-age ceremonies. The female Po mask, on the other hand, was worn by men dressed as women, depicting female ancestors, a sign of respect in a matriarchal society. Women in most African cultures painted walls, wove cloth, and produced ceramics, none of which, interestingly, is represented in our College Board list of required works. And yes, I have complained about this. Bundu masks are worn by women in to mark, uh, to mark special occasions. Young women at the stage of puberty spend three months secluded in the forest learning the secrets of womanhood. By the way, the initiation rites included female genital mutilation, which has come under considerable and, in my view, deserved criticism from women's rights advocates. The Mbudye Association was created in the 1700s as a council charged with preserving and interpreting both the political systems of the Luba state and its history. Lukasa or memory boards are mnemonic devices, that means memory enhancing devices, that enable the elite members of this community to recall information concerning genealogy, court ceremony, cultural heroes, clan migrations, and the location of things within the royal compound or tribal territory. A Lukasa might also map out spirit capitals, palaces of deceased rulers abandoned by new kings to become receptacles of the former king's memories. Lukasas must be small enough to be held easily, and they are read by moving a forefinger over the attached objects. The peoples of the Republic of Gabon, the Fang peoples of the Republic of Gabon, derive a sense of continuity with their past as well as communal cohesion. Uh, through an ancestral cult known as Bieri. Bieri, or reliquary figures, are placed on top of bark containers that hold the skulls of important clan ancestors. These reliquaries enable a migratory people, such as the Fang, to carry the remains of important ancestors from place to place. The reliquary figures and the containers were made of light materials so that they were easy to carry. One of the many tragedies of the British punitive expedition of 1897 against Benin is that the order of the Benin plaques was lost to indiscriminate looting and with it a priceless opportunity to learn more about the kingdom's history. Here are two early 20th century paintings, both required works, that show the influence of African masks. Stay tuned. Note that the golden stool is made of gold-plated wood, the gold again reflecting its importance as a sacred object. I've talked about lost wax casting in my Hindu art podcast, and I think Ms. Jacobs explained it further. Here we see works that employ fibers, and this will also be an important element of Pacific art. I trust you remember the Great Mosque of Jene. The other image is a wall from the Great Zimbabwe complex. Traditional African architecture was built to be cool and comfortable in the hot African sun, which is why mud brick walls and thatched roofs predominated and most of these works have not survived. The royal complex at Zimbabwe is an exception. Its architects and builders employed sophisticated masonry, that is stone, designs that subsequently more or less disappeared from the continent. Interestingly, given these impressive stone walls, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that it was used as a military site. It was a trading center. What you see here, by the way, is ashlar masonry. That means stone walls that do not use mortar to hold them together. You'll need to know that term on your test. The nails, beads, bottle caps, and buttons are all materials acquired in trade with Europeans. Note that wood is the base for all of these works. Okay, that's more than enough to get you started. Good luck on your presentations.